Hello friends, welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Divya Saleem, Assistant Professor, National Law Institute University, Bhopal. In connection with this, with the EPG Patshala project on social legislations and crime, today I would be dealing with socio-economic perspective of immoral trafficking. Now this topic has the following learning, learning objectives. First, to acquaint the students with the act of trafficking and prostitution, to describe and examine the economic perspectives of immoral trafficking in India with emphasis on the demand and supply theory. Third, to describe and examine the social perspective of immoral trafficking in India. Fourth, to kindle an analytical approach in students, equipping them to appreciate the social and economic impact of immoral trafficking on the Indian society. As an introduction, I would say that Invention of trade is the most effective method of satisfying human needs and wants. Be it any society, humans have done this and it was quite natural that gradually they traded on humans itself. Human trade or slave trade existed in the early civilizations and sex trade with prostitution flourished maximum during the colonial period. During the 1800s, trafficking of women were done on a massive scale to meet the demands of military troops, administrators and laborers in the colonial and frontier areas. Although trafficking of humans, an obscene and despicable outrage of violation of human rights, can accurately be considered or described as the oldest business that humankind has ever engaged in, the commercialization of human beings and their exploitation in diverse forms has earned the status of transnational organized crime in the modern day. It must be borne in mind that defining the expression trafficking is in itself a Herculean task which is one of the primary reasons why most of the national legislations and international conventions on trafficking do not feature a definition for this term. The first attempt to this was made in the United Nations Protocol to prevent, suppress and punish trafficking in persons, especially women and children, which is enhancing the United Nations Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime of 2000. This protocol is widely known as the Palermo Protocol. Definition of trafficking has been given under Article 3, Paragraph A of the United Nations Protocol to prevent, suppress and punish trafficking in persons, especially women and children, widely known as the Palermo Protocol, as the recruitment, transportation, transfer, harboring, or receipt of persons by means of threat or use of force or other forms of coercion, of abduction, of fraud, of deception, of the abuse of power or of a position of vulnerability or of giving or receiving of payments or benefits to achieve the consent of a person having control over another person for the purpose of exploitation. Exploitation shall include at a minimum the exploitation of prostitution of others or other forms of sexual exploitation, forced labor or services, slavery or practices similar to slavery, servitude or removal of organs. Hence, we understand that the term trafficking includes within its ambit a wide range of aspects, prostitution of male, female and child, adult and child pornography, forced labor services, slavery and or such other forms of practices similar to it, servitude and organ removal. In India at present, usage of immoral trafficking in legal parlance is meant to express prostitution only and therefore the two forms are usually used interchangeably. Immoral trafficking in India is definitely a multi-dimensional phenomenon, the study of which requires or necessitates a multidisciplinary approach. Relevance of understanding the socio-economic, historical, cultural as well as cultural conditions of the country is necessary to get a clear picture of this institution in the country and why it continues to strive even as we speak. Prostitution in India does not enjoy a societal sanction and appeal. Sex work is mostly seen as the outcome of moral degradation or economic constraint and this probably explains the reason why majority of the studies which are made on the subject focuses on why people enter, enter this field. 
sex trafficking or human trafficking for the purpose of prostitution has scaled new heights attaining zenith and is still growing in the modern day. Now we move on to the economic perspective of immoral trafficking in India. Now we need to understand what exactly is meant by economic perspective. It means a viewpoint that envisions individuals and institutions making rational decisions by comparing the marginal benefits and marginal cost associated with their actions. To explain this, I'll take two examples. Let's say for instance, if I need to start a business, I would first look into what are the maximum costs that or the input that I would have to give for the business and how much would that profit be. So after making the calculations, I would decide as to which would be the most appropriate business venture for me. Now applying the same logic in criminal law, let's say for instance, if a person wants to rob an ATM, he would before deciding to do that, have a mental calculation on the cost as well as the benefits of his actions. Cost in the sense, how much would, how much of a work would he have to invest? How much would be, what would be the possible risk that is involved? And after furthering all of this, if his benefit is much higher than the marginal cost, then he would decide to go forward with his actions. Now we apply the same logic to the case of prostitution also. The clandestine nature, nature of the sex sector in India definitely mars the precise determination of its size and economic significance and this dilemma gets escalated due to the non-acknowledgement of contribution of prostitution to the gross domestic product of the country. We look into one of the sub-points now, prostitution as a means offering economic incentives. Economic desperation is considered as one of the primary compelling reasons which is followed by lack of education facilities and adequate employment opportunities. Now this happens to be these two factors coupled together forms the primary reason as to why people engage in prostitution. Moreover, the impact of globalization. Globalization has made rural, rural poverty level increased and because of which there are chances of greater levels of exploitation of women. Unskilled workers no longer hold good in globalized world and rural women mostly engaging in unskilled labor hardly gets any protection or recognition in the new economy thus making them all the more vulnerable, vulnerable to immoral trafficking. Extensive economic incentives along with employment opportunities to all directly and indirectly involved with this industry has been a very crucial factor as which, 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 which could be considered as one of the reasons as to why this industry thrives. To explain this, we need to look into the parties which are involved directly and indirectly in the industry. Firstly, I would deal with the parties which are or the parties who are directly involved in the business. First, family of the families of the prostitute. Families of the prostitute may be the most important beneficiary of this particular uh, profession. They, they might be knowing or they might not be knowing that somebody from their family is engaged in prostitution. However, the entire family survives on the earnings of such a prostitute. Second, owners, managers, pims and other employees of the sex establishments. Third, owners, managers, cashiers, waiters, valets and other supporting staff of entertainment sectors such as that of massage parlors. Now these form the parties, these three categories form the parties who are directly involved or who are the direct beneficiaries of this particular profession. Coming to the second head which is parties indirectly involved. That would involve five categories. First, medical practitioners who provide regular health checkup for prostitutes. Second, operators of food stalls and hotels in the vicinity. Suppliers of cigarettes and liquor intended to be consumed, they form the third category. Owners of the apartments and buildings used for sexual transactions form the fourth category. And the fifth, people offering conveyance to sex establishments such as cab, cab drivers, auto wallas, rickshaw drivers, etc. So we understand that it is not just the prostitute who is earning benefit out of the income that she is deriving by this act. 
there are lot many other people who are involved directly or indirectly with this particular profession and therefore there they they act as the subsidiary subsidiary beneficiaries as far as this profession is concerned moving on to the second sub point prostitution and demand supply theory of economics prostitution has been considered as a source of foreign exchange with its growth as a transnational industry onset of sex tourism in india now this has happened after the globalization and india at present is known as the hub of child sex tourism it is considered as the most lucrative form of illegal trade after arms and drug peddling and hence is undertaken by organized criminals also children are trafficked into india from bangladesh and nepal and further trafficking through india trafficked through india to pakistan and middle east now this this is apart from the children who are trafficked within the country the next part is meaning of demand and supply in common parlance the term demand expresses a desire by people for a particular kind of person commodity or service while supply indicates the quantity of something that is easily available including people commodity or service in prostitution there is primarily a demand for commercial sex to supply the tra- which the traffickers utilize vulnerable people whom i call as commodity and traffic or supply them for commercial sex to be more precise in prostitution the term demand indicates three levels of requirement first the employer demand referring to the requirements of the employers contractors owners managers or pimps second consumer demand referring to the requirement of clients within the sex industry by this category what i mean is clients would want i mean people of certain body structure certain skin color certain uh, hair color or even eye color the third would be third party demand which indicates the requirement of parties who are involved in the process such as recruiters agents transporters and those who knowingly participate in prostitution at any stage of the progression prostitution in india is a monopolistic highly competitive industry where the sellers that is the human traffickers offer a variety of pro- products or commodity by which i mean vulnerable people that is virgin girls young boys women of specific body structure hair and skin color etc depending upon the demand of the prospective buyers that is the customers or the clients the allied factors include lack of employment opportunities and the absence of governmental interest to improve the existing situations moving on to the third limb of the presentation which is the social perspective of immoral trafficking in with specific reference to india now when we talk about prostitution in india it is definitely pertinent to keep in mind that prostitution in india has had a long a very long history and started as part of a cultural and religiously sanctioned practice now how does it how did it happen to emphasize on that i would start with the early system of devdasis the word devdasi is a sanskrit word which mean which means female slave of god and this system marks the beginning of such religious customs and traditions in india where a girl is dedicated to a deity an object of worship or to a temple at birth or when she is quite young she is required to be part of all the daily rituals and occasional ceremonies of the temple and being in service of the deity accorded ritual sanctity and social eminence they although they were associated with the deities in many of the temples they were sexually exploited and presumably over a period of time their functions came to involve meeting the needs of the earthly gods such as the kings powerful chieftains and wealthy individuals it is an interesting fact to know that families of the upper class never offered their girl children as devdasis instead bought children from the lower caste parents and offered them to the temples this over a period of time became peculiar of the lower caste people and continues to do so even today during the mughal era muslim girls were used as tawaif to be used as means of entertainment in the courts 
Now this, the Devdasi system deteriorated drastically during the Mughal and the British era and started getting portrayed as against public morality. It went on to get prohibited through the laws enacted to the British regime. The first legislation being the Bombay Devdasi's Act of 1934, which continued even after post-independence. In, during the post-independence era, the first legislation which was brought forth into the, in this effect was the Madras Devdasi's Prevention of Dedication Act 1947 and the most recent one is the Maharashtra Devdasi's Abolition Act of 2006. These legislations prevent women from dancing and singing in temples or religious occasions, all of which led to the withdrawal of long-term means of sustenance for these women. With no possible means to sustain themselves, commercialized sex became a very attractive alternative. In modern India, there exist several spots where prostitution is considered as tradition and resorted to by women for their livelihood. For example, Bediyas and Bacharas of Madhya Pradesh, Natpurvas of Uttar Pradesh. Coming to the second point, prostitution as the outcome of gender inequality and commodification of women. Under this point, I would say that prostitution thrives on gender inequality and perpetuates to a large extent the subjugation of women. The perception that men have a right to buy sex is a direct negation to a society based on gender inequality. The combined effect of all these promotes prostitution where a prostitute is a mere sexual commodity with specific attributes suiting to the individual client requirements meant to serve as an object that is consumed by men. Now this is a very sad picture because by being a prostitute, a woman loses her right as a human being in the eyes of men. With the onset of globalization, India along with many other countries opened up promoting tourism. This in turn led to sex tourism experiencing a phenomenal growth in all forms of prostitution. For these sex buyers, humanity of the victim is of least concern. They use them for pleasure and it is and the fact that once they have become a prostitute, an individual becomes an object and therefore exploitation and abuse is but natural. Coming to the sociological perspective. Now, as I said, the third limb of my presentation would be on sociological perspective in which I have basically covered social, I mean, prostitution as a customary and a religious practice and prostitution as a result of gender inequality. Coming to the third aspect of this topic, I would talk about sociological perspective and I would try to mention prostitution or look at prostitution from sociological theories. Before that, we need to understand what we mean by social perspective. Social perspective of any subject is the study of human life and social interactions as well as how these interactions shape groups and society as a whole. This perspective views society as a product created by humans that can be changed by them as well. There are three major sociological perspectives. They are symbolic interactionism, functionalism and conflict theory. In this section, I would try to cover prostitution from all these perspectives. Before attempting to venture into that, we need to look into what these perspectives are. I would be dealing with them individually and then looking at that apply or apply that perspective to examine prostitution. I start with the first one which is symbolic interactionism. Symbolic interactionism also known as the symbolic interaction theory is a perspective that puts a large emphasis and symbolic meaning on social interactions that humans develop. This theory was introduced by the philosopher George Herbert Mead but can be traced back to Max Weber also. Now this theory examines the meanings that people impose on objects, events and behaviours. Applying this perspective to prostitution, we find that prostitution from a symbolic interactionist perspective focuses on the extent of skills and personal vigour acquired by a prostitute in order to survive in this socially condemned profession. 
We also find that the maximum amount of training that is undergone by a prostitute is with respect to handling and maintaining her clients, how to earn maximum amount of money with least amount of work, maintaining oneself that is looks, hygiene and grooming, art of conversation with clients, working habits, personal style, enthusiasm and self-respect. In short, various strategies are learned by a prostitute which will cater her occupational identity as a professional. Moving on to the second perspective which is the functionalism. Functionalism is a theory which was formed by Emily Durkheim which analyzes how social order is possible and how society remains stable. It postulates that each part of the society functions to provide stability for the whole society and that if a society is disorganized, it must change itself to stabilize. Applying this to explain prostitution, we find that prostitution primarily focuses on prototype of associations amongst prostitutes, pens and customers and its impact. It depicts prostitution as a form of deviance which is necessary and beneficial for the survival of the society because of the following reasons. 1. It provides employment opportunities to women. 2. It offers opportunities to men for sexual experimentation outside of their marriage when their spouses are not willing to play along. Third, it keeps the marital relationships intact as relationship with a prostitute is merely a physical relationship without any emotions involved. This restricts respectable sexual relationships, childbearing and child rearing all of which are part of marital relationship itself. It guarantees opportunities to quench sexual appetites of men who are away from their home for a longer period of time owing to their employment. It ensures opportunities to satisfy the sexual urges of men who are unable to compete in the marriage market. Now coming to the third theory which is the conflict theory, it has been derived from the works of Karl Marx who studied power and coercion and its effect on the social order. Marx believed that those with great, great political, economic and social resources would hold the maximum power in the society and they in turn would maintain social order through domination. Prostitution from a conflict theory perspective provides reasons for existence of female and child prostitution. It considers the existence of prostitution in society as a result of economic inequality. In a society where there is gender inequality, unequal access of employment or educational facilities, property rights and other resources along with restricted female access to the mainstream society, it is natural and inevitable that women would barter her body for economic support from men. It also offers explanation for child prostitution since young boys and girls as well as those from poor, poor financial background get minimal or no earning power and therefore for them the most alluring way to support themselves in the market is to offer their own body. This perspective holds good to explain the existence of prostitution in India. It focuses on the existence of gender disparity in all walks of life which coerces a woman or anybody to join the field of sex work and can justifies their decision to continue. To explain child prostitution, I am referring to the supply demand theory uh, and explaining the factors. The supply factors would include poverty, bonded debt and slavery, religiously sanctioned practices like devdasis and child marriage. Abandoned children, broken and dysfunctional families, natural calamities and poor rehabilitation factors also contribute to as the supply factors for easy availability of children who can be brought into child prostitution. Coming to the demand factors, the demand factors include growth of tourism, specifically sex tourism in the country, possibility of high profits getting generated with low risk, creation of need and market by sex traffickers for experimental and tender sex and the last factor which is the most interesting one misconception of child sex as a treatment for sexually transmitted diseases these factors contribute as the factors supplementing the demand aspect to summarize i would say that prostitution in india or immoral trafficking in india can be defined from or can be seen from a sociological perspective as well as from an economical perspective. I have tried to explain the economic perspective by saying or by looking at it from 
uh, you, by using the demand supply theory and from the social perspective on three limbs. One which is prostitution starting as a religious and a customary practice, prostitution existing because of gender disparity and explaining prostitution using the, uh, using the three sociological theories. To conclude, I would say that in India, maximum attempt has been made or is being made to eradicate this social evil. My understanding of the subject makes me say that it's not just providing law or punishment that would be made as and that would create an answer for eradicating the social evil. However, if we approach, if we take or if we go approach things from a multi-dimensional method, then a target can be achieved in a much better way. When I say target, ach achieving the target in a much better way, what I mean is not just the laws in place, but also addressing the economic and social factors which are contributing to the existence of prostitution so that the social evil can be eradicated from its root. Moreover, educating the civil society about this evil as well as addressing the socio-economic causes seems to be the only plausible way to move or to remove this particular social evil. Thank you.